Hi everyone, it's Professor Primton, and it's been going to talk about real zeros of polynomials. So from the previous video, we actually talked about that the factor theorem actually helps us finding the zeros of a polynomial function, because finding the real zeros of a polynomial function actually gives us factors for the polynomial function. So we actually can have the function factored into linear factors, and then we can solve the resulting equations to find out the real zeros of the polynomial function. In this section, we're going to actually study some algebraic methods to help us find the real zeros of a polynomial function. So in this video, we're going to talk about the rational zeros theorem to help us find out what's called rational zeros of a polynomial function. And then we're also going to talk about how to find the real zeros of a polynomial function to write the function in its factored form. So let's talk about the rational zeros of polynomial functions. So to help us understand the next theorem, we're going to do an example. We're going to consider this polynomial function, capital P of x is equal to this polynomial x minus 2, that factor, times the factor x minus 3, times the factor x plus 4. And if you multiply these three factors together, you'll get x cubed, subtract x squared, subtract 14x plus 24. Notice that in the factored form, you have real zeros of x equals 2, x equals 3, and x equals negative 4, because when you find the real zeros of a polynomial function, you set the P of x equal to 0, and if you have a product that's equal to 0, at least one of the factors must be 0. And so you'll get x equals 2, x equals 3, and x equals negative 4 as the real zeros of the polynomial function. However, notice that if you have the polynomial actually expanded or multiplied out, the constant term is 24. 24 is obtained by multiplying the real zeros, 2 times 3 times 4, and that is 24. And if you ignore the signs, that's exactly the constant term. So the constant term turns out to be the product of the factors 2, 3, and 4. So in other words, in this previous example, the real zeros of the polynomial function capital P of x were the factors of the constant term. So this is a theorem called the rational zeros theorem. If the polynomial function capital P of x is written in its standard form, a sub n, x to the n power, plus a sub n minus 1, x to the n minus 1, plus dot dot dot, a sub 1x plus a sub 0, if each of the coefficients are integers, so positive counting numbers and negative counting numbers, and also zero. If the leading coefficient is not zero, and the constant term is not zero, then every rational zero of the polynomial function p of x is of this form. p divided by q, where p must be a factor of the constant term, a sub zero, and q, the denominator, is a factor of the leading coefficient, a sub n. And so this is what's called a rational zero because it's a fraction of two different factors. The numerator has to be a factor of the constant term, the denominator has to be a factor of the leading coefficient, and the factors of the polynomial must be of the form p divided by q, whenever the polynomial has integer coefficients. As we're going to see, the rational zeros theorem actually says if the leading coefficient of the polynomial is either 1 or negative 1, then the rational zeros of that polynomial function must be factors of only the constant term, as we saw in our previous example. So as we use the rational zeros theorem, keep in mind, we're going to use guidelines to help us explain how to use the rational zeros theorem whenever we can use polynomial and synthetic division to help us factor the polynomial function into a product of linear or quadratic factors. So these are the guidelines. Finding the rational zeros of a polynomial function. So step one, you list out all the possible rational zeros using the rational zeros theorem, where the numerator, p, must be a factor of the constant term, a sub zero, and the denominator, q, must be a factor of the leading coefficient, a sub n. Step two, use the remainder theorem and either polynomial or synthetic division to evaluate the polynomial at each of the candidates for the rational zeros theorem that you found in the previous step. When the remainder is zero, then we know by the factor theorem that we have a factor for the polynomial function. And then from either synthetic division or polynomial division, you can find out the quotient polynomial that you have obtained. And then step three, you repeat steps one and two for this quotient function, which will also be a polynomial function. You can stop whenever you reach a quotient that is either a quadratic function that factors easily, or you can solve the quadratic equation using a quadratic formula to factor to find the remaining real zeros. So example one, we're going to use the rational zeros theorem to understand what that actually tells us. Find the rational zeros of the polynomial function, capital P of x is equal to 2x cubed plus 11x squared subtract 7x subtract 6. So notice that each of the coefficients are integers. You have 2, 11, negative 7, and negative 6 as coefficients. So we can use the rational zeros theorem. The possible rational zeros are of the form p divided by q, where p is the numerator, factors of the constant term. Well, the factors of the constant term would be factors of negative 6. And the denominator, q, must be factors of the leading coefficient. Well, the leading coefficient is 2 in this case. So the numerator, factors of negative 6. Well, all the numbers that go into negative 6 evenly are plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, plus or minus 3, or plus or minus 6. Each of these numbers will go into negative 6 evenly, without a remainder. 
and then q must be a factor of the leading coefficient, which in this case was 2. So factors of 2 are plus or minus 1 or plus or minus 2, the only numbers that go into 2 evenly without a remainder. And so now you have all the possible rational zeros. You can have plus or minus 1 divided by plus or minus 1, so that is plus or minus 1 as a possibility for your rational zero. You can have plus or minus 1 divided by plus or minus 2, so that is plus or minus a half. You can also have plus or minus 2 divided by plus or minus 1, so that's plus or minus 2. You can have plus or minus 2 divided by plus or minus 2, well that's plus or minus 1, which we already have. You can have plus or minus 3 divided by plus or minus 1, that's plus or minus 3. Plus or minus 3 divided by plus or minus 2 is plus or minus 3 halves. And then you can also have plus or minus 6 divided by plus or minus 1, that's plus or minus 6. And then plus or minus 6 divided by plus or minus 2 is plus or minus 3, which we already have. So it looks like there are 12 different possible rational zeros for this polynomial function. You have plus or minus 1, 2, 3, 6, 1 half, or 3 halves. So whenever we're trying to find out the real zeros of this polynomial function, it's only from this list of 12 possible rational zeros. Okay, example 2, finding the rational zeros. So use the rational zeros theorem to identify all possible rational zeros, just like we did in the last example, for each of the following polynomial functions, and then we'll go one step further. Write the polynomial function in its factored form. So number one, we're going to look at this polynomial function, f of x is equal to x cubed, subtract 3x plus 2. So notice that you don't have the x squared term, it's a 0. So it's x cubed plus 0x squared, subtract 3x plus 2. So let's use the rational zeros theorem to figure out what are the, all the possible rational zeros for this polynomial function. Because you have integer coefficients, you have 1, negative 3, and 2 as the coefficients for this polynomial. So the rational zeros theorem says that the numerator, p, must be factors of the constant term, which is factors of 2. And the denominator has to be factors of the leading coefficient, which in this case is 1. So factors of the leading coefficient would be factors of 1. And so the numerator, factors of 2, is plus or minus 1 and plus or minus 2. And then factors of the leading coefficient, factors of 1 is plus or minus 1. So there's not that many candidates this time. You only have plus or minus 1 divided by plus or minus 1. Well, that's plus or minus 1. And then you also have plus or minus 2 divided by plus or minus 1. That's plus or minus 2. You only have four possible candidates for rational zeros in this case plus or minus 1, and plus or minus 2. So what you'll do next is actually test out using the remainder theorem to find, do you actually get a remainder of 0 whenever you divide by x minus 1, or x plus 1, or x minus 2, or x plus 2. So let's check that. If you use the remainder theorem and also the factor theorem, let's see what we get when we try to evaluate f of 1. So that would be whenever you divide by x subtract 1. So you take this polynomial function and you divide by x minus 1, the remainder is f of 1, according to the remainder theorem. So if you substitute 1 into your polynomial function, you'll get 1 cubed minus 3 times 1 plus 2, and that is 0. And so since the remainder is 0, that means whenever you take this polynomial function f of x and divide by x minus 1, because you plugged in x equals 1, this means that x subtract 1 is a factor of that polynomial function. And so now we can actually find out what is the quotient polynomial by using synthetic division or long division. So let's use synthetic division. If you take the polynomial function f of x, which is x cubed subtract 3x plus 2, and divide by x minus 1, we know the remainder will be 0. And so if you use synthetic division, you'll have 1 on the outside, because you're dividing by x minus 1, and then you have the coefficients of f of x, your dividend polynomial, which is 1, 0, x squared, minus 3x, and 2, so 1, 0, negative 3, and 2 are the coefficients. Drop down the leading coefficient, 1, 1 times 1 gives you 1, so 1 goes underneath the 0, you add, so 0 plus 1 gives you 1, and now repeat, 1 times 1 gives you 1, that goes underneath the negative 3 coefficient. And then you add vertically, so negative 3 plus 1 gives you negative 2. And then 1 times negative 2 gives you negative 2. And then add again, 2 plus negative 2 is 0. Well, we already knew the remainder was 0 because the remainder theorem said we got 0 whenever we plugged in c equals 1. What we want is the quotient polynomial. And the quotient polynomial is negative 2 for the constant term, 1 for the x term, and 1 for the x squared term are the coefficients. So whenever you take x cubed minus 3x plus 2 divided by x minus 1, the quotient is x squared plus x minus 2 plus the remainder was 0, and you place it over what you were dividing by, the divisor polynomial, which was x minus 1. And so that just cancels out. That's just 0. And you'll have x squared plus x minus 2. That's the quotient polynomial after you divide by x minus 1 from f of x. So how this helps us is that we now know how f of x will factor. f of x will factor as x minus 1 times the quotient polynomial x squared plus x minus 2 because there's no remainder. So now if you take this quotient polynomial, which is quadratic, and you can factor it easily, then we'll have the complete factorization of f of x. And so x squared plus x minus 2, that does factor. You have a trinomial. Find two numbers that multiply to negative 2, and the same two numbers add to 1. 
Well, the two numbers that work are positive 2 and negative 1. So x minus 1 is already a factor of f of x. We already knew that from the remainder theorem. But x squared plus x minus 2 will factor as x plus 2 and x minus 1. And so now f of x will factor completely as f of x is equal to x plus 2, and you have x minus 1 times x minus 1, so it's x minus 1 squared. That's the factored form of this polynomial function f of x, x cubed minus 3x plus 2. And notice that all the real zeros of this polynomial function would be x equals negative 2 and x equals 1, which were from the candidates list of the possible rational zeros. So let's try another problem. Number 2, this time the polynomial function g of x is equal to 3x cubed plus 8x squared subtract 7x subtract 12. Well, since the coefficients are 3, 8, negative 7, and negative 12, those are all integer coefficients, so we can use the rational zeros theorem. The numerator is p, it must be factors of the constant term, and the denominator q must be factors of the leading coefficient. Well, factors of the constant term, the numerator, what are all the numbers that go into 12, or negative 12? Well, you can have plus or minus 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, and 12. Those will all go into negative 12 evenly without a remainder. And then factors of the leading coefficient, the factors for q, are what numbers will go into the leading coefficient 3? Well, plus or minus 1 and plus or minus 3 only. And so you have several possible rational zeros in this case. The possible rational zeros are all these different fractions that can be formed. You can have plus or minus 1 divided by plus or minus 1, so you have that one. You have plus or minus 1 divided by plus or minus 3, that's plus or minus 1 third. You can have plus or minus 2 divided by plus or minus 1, that's plus or minus 2. Plus or minus 2 divided by plus or minus 3 is plus or minus 2 thirds. You can have plus or minus 3 divided by plus or minus 1, got that one. Plus or minus 3 divided by plus or minus 3, well, we already have that one, that's plus or minus 1. You can have plus or minus 4 divided by plus or minus 1, that's plus or minus 4. Plus or minus 4 divided by plus or minus 3 is plus or minus 4 thirds. You have plus or minus 6 divided by plus or minus 1, that's plus or minus 6. Plus or minus 6 divided by plus or minus 3 is plus or minus 2, which we already have. And then plus or minus 12 divided by plus or minus 1, well, that's plus or minus 12. And then plus or minus 12 divided by plus or minus 3 is plus or minus 4, which we already have. So it looks like there are 18 different possible rational zeros in this case. Plus or minus 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 12, plus or minus 2 thirds, 4 thirds, and also 1 third. So now we're ready to actually use the remainder and factor theorems to find out what possible rational zeros will actually give us a remainder of 0, and that will tell us factors of this polynomial function g of x. So let's see. If you substitute in negative 3 into the function g, you'll have g of negative 3 would be 3 times negative 3 cubed plus 8 times negative 3 squared minus 7 times negative 3 minus 12. That does turn out to be 0. And so if the remainder is 0, whenever g of x is divided by x minus negative 3, so that would be whenever you divide by x plus 3, that means x plus 3 is a factor of g of x because the remainder is 0. And so now that we know a factor for the polynomial function g of x, we can use synthetic division or long division. Let's use synthetic division. So if you take g of x and divide by x plus 3, we know the remainder is 0. But we want to find out what is the quotient polynomial. So if you take 3x cubed plus 8x squared minus 7x minus 12 and divide by x plus 3, whenever the c is negative 3, we know the remainder is 0. And so the c is negative 3 because you plug negative 3 in and you got a remainder of 0. So negative 3 goes on the outside of the division bar and the coefficients go on the inside for the dividend polynomial. 3, 8, negative 7, and negative 12. And so now drop down the leading coefficient, 3, multiply c, negative 3 times 3 will give you negative 9, and then add. The negative 9 goes right underneath the 8, so you'll add now. 8 plus negative 9 gives you negative 1, and now repeat. Negative 3 times negative 1 will give you positive 3, so 3 goes underneath the negative 7. Now add, negative 7 plus 3 gives you negative 4, and then negative 3 times negative 4 is positive 12, and then negative 12 plus positive 12 is 0. We already knew the remainder was 0 because we just found that out from the remainder theorem. We want the quotient polynomial. The quotient polynomial has a constant term of negative 4, x term of negative 1, and the coefficient of x squared is 3. The quotient polynomial is 3x squared minus x minus 4 whenever you take the function g of x and divide by x plus 3. And the remainder was 0, and you place it over the divisor, x plus 3, and so you just get x squared minus x minus 4. And so if you multiply everything by the LCD, or the least common denominator of x plus 3, you'll find out that g of x is equal to x plus 3 times the quotient polynomial, 3x squared minus x minus 4. And now you can either factor this polynomial using the AC method, or you can repeat the remainder and factor theorems using a different possible rational zero, and find out does it actually give you a remainder of zero or not, which will tell you a factor for the polynomial g of x. Well, let's try that method. So let's call q of x the quotient polynomial, 3x squared minus x minus 4. 
If you substitute a negative 1 into the quotient polynomial, you will get 0 because you have 3 times negative 1 squared minus negative 1 for the x and then minus 4, you will get 0. So that means if you plug in negative 1 and for the value of c, it would be x subtract negative 1 or x plus 1 is a factor of the quotient polynomial. So now you know two factors for the polynomial function g of x. You know that x plus 3 is a factor of g of x, and now you know that x plus 1 is also a factor of g of x. And so you can rewrite g of x as x plus 3 times x plus 1, and the other factor turns out to be 3x minus 4. And so this is the factored form for the polynomial function g of x. Notice that the real zeros of this polynomial function would be x equals negative 3, x equals negative 1, and x equals 4 thirds, again, which would be coming from your 18 possible rational zeros. So let's finish up this video with one more problem. Number three, let's, let's take the polynomial function h of x, which is equal to x to the fourth minus 5x cubed minus 5x squared plus 23x plus 10. This time we'll have a degree four polynomial function that we want to factor completely. So the rational zeros theorem can be used because the coefficients are 1, negative 5, negative 5, 23, and 10. Those are all integer coefficients. So the rational zeros theorem says that the numerator must be factors of the constant term, which would be factors of 10. Well, the only numbers that go into 10 evenly would be plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, plus or minus 5, and plus or minus 10. And then the factors of the leading coefficient would be factors of q. Well, that could be plus or minus 1 because the leading coefficient is just 1. So there are only eight possible rational zeros. You can have plus or minus 1 divided by plus or minus 1. You can have plus or minus 2 divided by plus or minus 1. Plus or minus 5 divided by plus or minus 1. And plus or minus 10 divided by plus or minus 1. So you have plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, plus or minus 5, plus or minus 10. So eight possible rational zeros. So let's use the remainder theorem and factor theorem now to find out which of these eight are actually real zeros for the polynomial function h of x. So it turns out if you substitute negative 2 into the polynomial function h of x, you'll have negative 2 to the fourth minus 5 times negative 2 cubed minus 5 times negative 2 squared plus 23 times negative 2 plus 10, which does give you 0. So the remainder is 0 whenever the polynomial function h of x is divided by x subtract negative 2 or x plus 2. So let's use synthetic division to find out what is the quotient polynomial. So if you take h of x and divide by x plus 2, you'll have x to the fourth minus 5x cubed minus 5x squared plus 23x plus 10 and divide by the divisor polynomial x plus 2. Using synthetic division, this is what you would have. You would have negative 2 on the outside because c is equal to negative 2. That's the value that you plugged in to give you a remainder of 0. And now the coefficients of the dividend polynomial go inside the division bar. You'll have 1, negative 5, negative 5, 23, and 10 because there are no missing terms in the dividend polynomial. And now drop down the leading coefficient 1 and now multiply. Negative 2 times 1 gives you negative 2. So negative 2 goes underneath the negative 5 and now add. Negative 5 plus negative 2 gives you negative 7. And now take negative 2 times negative 7 to get 14. 14 goes underneath the negative 5 and now add vertically. Negative 5 plus 14 gives you positive 9. So negative 2 times 9 gives you negative 18. 23 minus 18 gives you 5. And then negative 2 times 5 gives you negative 10. And the last column is 10 subtract 10, which is 0. And that last number is the remainder, which we already knew should have been 0 because the remainder theorem said if you plug in negative 2 for your value of c and the remainder is 0, then x plus 2 is a factor of the polynomial function h of x. And so we want the quotient polynomial again. The quotient polynomial will have a constant term of 5. An x term will have coefficient of 9. The x squared term will have a coefficient of negative 7. And the x cubed term will have a coefficient of 1. So the quotient polynomial would be x cubed minus 7x squared plus 9x plus 5 plus the remainder was 0 divided by what you're dividing by was x plus 2. And so if you simplify, you'll have x cubed minus 7x squared plus 9x plus 5. That is the quotient polynomial. And now you can repeat the remainder and factor theorems with the quotient polynomial q of x equals x cubed minus 7x squared plus 9x plus 5. So again, you only have eight possible rational zeros to choose from. Let's try c equals 5 this time for a rational zero. So if you plug in 5 into either your quotient polynomial or if you plug in 5 into the original polynomial, you will find out is the remainder 0, and that will tell you whether you have a factor or not. So if you plug in 5 into the original polynomial, you have 5 to the 4th, minus 5 times 5 cubed, minus 5 times 5 squared, plus 23 times 5, plus 10. That does turn out to be 0. So h of 5 is equal to 0. So the remainder is 0 whenever you take the polynomial function h of x and divide by x subtract 5, because the c is equal to 5 in this case. And so now we have another factor for the polynomial h of x. So we have h of x is equal to x plus 2 times the quotient polynomial x cubed minus 7x squared plus 9x plus 5. But we just found out another factor for the polynomial function h of x. It is x subtract 5 also. So you'll have x plus 2 times x minus 5 
And then if you do another synthetic division or long division, you'll find out that another quotient polynomial after you divide by x minus 5 will be x squared subtract 2x minus 1. And so the factored form of h of x is x plus 2 times the factor x minus 5 times the factor x squared minus 2x minus 1. That last factor does not factor any further. You don't have any two numbers that multiply to negative 1 and also two numbers that add to negative 2. So this trinomial does not factor very easily. So the polynomial h of x factors as x plus 2, that factor, times the factor x minus 5, times the quadratic factor, x squared minus 2x minus 1. So this is a good place to stop our video now that we talked about the rational zeros theorem and actually how to find the rational zeros of a polynomial function and also how to find the real zeros of a polynomial function to write the function in its factored form. If you have any questions about any examples in this video, please let me know. Or if you have any questions while you work on the homework for this section, please let me know that as well. And I'll see you at the next video when we talk about Descartes' rule of signs and also continuing to factor a polynomial to find its real zeros.